Uh, I'm Dwayne Beck. I manage the Dakota Lakes Research Farm at Pier South Dakota and have for almost 30 years, actually. Um, <clears throat> I guess we get to be the closing presentation at the conference, which is going to be a large task because of all the quality speakers there. But I guess what I'm going to address is the fact that we probably know the problems and we probably know the answers. We just don't necessarily have the discipline to implement the answers. So uh, that's about the big summary of, of what we're going to talk about. Well, the Codex Research Farm is a farmer-owned entity. Uh, it's been in operation. The, the corporation's been in, in existence since the 1980s. The farm has been there since 1990. And, and we kind of started the no-till diverse rotation system in the central part of the United States. And it was, it was at first out of need to stop the runoff from irrigators and then grew into stopping the runoff on dry land farms, which allowed us to grow a lot of crops and do things that we, we couldn't do if we didn't manage the soil better. So we can limit how much of the really good stuff they get and, and then give them fill from the corn stalks, the leaves and the husk and whatever in the corn stalks. Now we're fall calving, so uh, not with this bunch, but right now the ones we own, this was a rented bunch of cows. Um, but ours are fall calving, so they got calves at sight, so they get a little higher level of nutrition. It's a little dark, but see, we can see the Missouri River just like you can from here. It's the same water. They're coming, coming at a dead run because I've just started the irrigator moving. And, and they're, they're just kind of going, oh, yeah, it's breakfast. And, and they, <clears throat> we had, it, this was two years ago or uh, three winters ago, we had, we had 120 head. Of, of dry cows there is what we had at that time. Now we, we have uh, 40 of our own. But So there's a pivot. We're going to get better light here in a second. It's a tough place to work right along the river like that. You just don't have any good scenery or, or whatever. <clears throat> My first boss, uh, after he retired, he came out one day and he was riding with me on the combine and I'm combining down by the river and the pheasants are coming out, and the geese are landing, and a deer or two ran out, and whatever. And he, <clears throat> he looked at me and said, I paid you to do this, didn't I? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, Ray, but not enough. So, uh, <clears throat> so we're going to, there's the cows there. Then we're going to get another little view here in a second. Uh, that's a pivot, so we have, we have three lateral moves we have rigged up and, and one pivot that we use. And, and they go back and forth. So it's pretty easy once we get everything all situated. And we'll talk a little bit about this when we, when we get in. Uh, we do have a big uh, draw there that's with marginal ground. We've got tall grass prairie in it. And that's their place of refuge they go when we get a big blizzard. And a couple of years ago, Ruth and I <clears throat> went to Bolivia to visit our middle daughter who was spending a year there. We spent Christmas with her in Bolivia. And they had a big blizzard. And I had a neighbor of mine that felt so sorry for my cows because they were just moving wires that he brought some hay in the blizzard. He brought a bunch of hay down, threw some bales out in the draw, and sent me a video. Well, this last summer, he finally admitted that the cows looked at the hay because I could tell that they hadn't eaten it. They looked at the hay, took a couple of bites, and walked back out in the field. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> those cows have neck collars on them. You might have noticed that. Uh, they also have Fitbits, and we're, we're doing a bunch of stuff with, with uh, uh, figuring out how they're how they're reacting to different grazing systems. And our idea is eventually to automate grazing um, and moving the cows and doing those kind of things. Uh, doing those kind of things rather than, than um, having to go out there all the time. And it is very much fun to go out and deal with the cows, but sometimes you don't want to. Uh, the Cold Lakes Research Farm, as I said, is, is situated right on the Missouri River. Where <clears throat> you could hop in. We told Francis he could get in 
get in a boat and go down river and in a few days he'd be there. Um, he didn't think that looked like a fun thing to do. We have a lot of people in the summertime that come by our pump station on the river uh, tracing the <clears throat> path of Lewis and Clark and they're in these little boats or they're in canoes or something. But they're all going downriver. Now if they really wanted to do that they should be going upriver first. So anyways, we have both irrigated dry land and we also have this pasture land on this side which we're we're trying to bring back to native. It's all gone very degraded. And then we also have, uh, we'll have this land right along the river, what we call the core land, which we'll be grazing as well. Uh, native vegetation is, is mixed grass prairie with trees only in major drainage ways, just like it is here. It's very hard for them to understand that in Australia, but this is what we, we use to know what to do. What's the native? What would Mother Nature do there? Uh, there's another photo of, of the thing. We've got it broken up into small fields that are relatively uniform, and we do kind of set rotations on a lot of those fields. A uh, question came up yesterday about, well, somebody should invent a cedar that fits on the combine to plant cover crops. Uh, this was 2005. We have one of those. And <clears throat> this is an air cedar. Uh, that that's the tank. Uh, we spread the, the cover crop behind the header while the straw is still in the combine. So then you lay the residue back on top of the straw. This is not really hard. We've got a little um, uh, uh, radar on there that gives, controls the ground speed. And then we've got these little controllers. It's all done electric motors as far as the metering and stuff. You want to do that? You can do that. You can buy stuff in in, in uh, France that does that. They do that as a regular basis there. You can put it on with an airplane. We've done a lot of work with that. We've done a lot of work with seed coatings, and we've had limited success with absorbent seed coatings in our environment because it just gets too dry. You go east and do a lot of things, but we spent quite a bit of Howard Buffett's money. <laughs> looking at seed coatings. Howard gave us a little grant to do some things a couple of years ago, and we spent quite a bit on this seed coating idea, thinking we could spread them out there and get them to go, and we had airplanes going, and we, yeah, we had semi-loads of seed that went out. And we didn't have a great deal of success. This is one of them, you know, flax coming up in sunflowers, because that's one of our big bugaboos, is guys harvest sunflowers and ground wants to blow. So we, we flew a bunch of stuff into sunflowers. And that's flax, that came up, a lot of the other stuff didn't. So uh, I don't want to dwell on that, that's not what I'm here to talk about today. A few years ago, Ruth and I went to France. Um, we had a great time. Every time you went to a city in France, they take you to see their castle. Every little town has a castle. Jay's been there, they all got a castle. Got to go see the castle, and you look at the castle, and you look out, and. Everything's all degraded around the castle, and, you go, and they go, here's where they stored the grain in the castle. You go, well, where'd they grow the grain? Well, in the ground around the castle. It's so damn degraded, you can't grow anything on that ground. Maybe that's the reason it's not a castle anymore. <clears throat> but they're still plowing. We, in order to be a farmer in France, you have to go to an ag school and you have to get a degree. And then to farm, you, get, you have to get permission from a local group, kind of like a conservation district. But they, they, they tell you what practices you should use. And if you don't know how to plow and stuff, then you're, you're not going to get approved, even if your dad does own the land. And they had <clears throat> plows and tractors and horses with plows and everything at these ag schools. We did two meetings at these ag schools. In the first ag school, we had a bunch of farmers there. That was nice. We were doing our meeting. The president of the college came and welcomed us just like here. And then he left. And there wasn't any faculty members there. And there weren't any students. And I said, where are the students? Oh, they're not here. They're in class. They said, the students should be. I just got, Ruth was there. She was embarrassed. 
Um, I got very adamant that the students should be here. The next day we did one and the students were there. Filled the whole back of the auditorium with students. So they said, this American guy is really arrogant. <laughs> but they have ruined their soils. And I told the people in France, I said, the reason my ancestors left Europe was because they had degraded the soils to the point they could no longer could support themselves, and they left to come to the United States to find some more soil to degrade. <laughs> and they did a hell of a good job of it. We're just doing really wonderfully. We got big tractors. We can degrade it faster now than they used to be able to. <laughs> and the French have degraded all the level land, and they're starting to farm the side hills. And they're farming with plows, land so steep that they can't plow it on the contour. So they plow it up and down, but they actually plow it down because they can't pull it going up. So they drive up with the plow and plow down and drive up and plow down. <clears throat> In a 1786 letter to Alexander Hamilton, a few years more of increased sterility will drive the inhabitants of the Atlantic state westward for support. Whereas in if they were taught how to improve the old instead of going to pursue the new and productive soils, they would make these acres, which they now scarcely yield anything. Right? George Washington. He and Thomas Jefferson shared letters on that if they didn't change their farming practices, they would have to expand westward. In 1803, Thomas Jefferson bought the Louisiana Purchase because that was happening, right? Well, we haven't stopped. David Montgomery's book talk about places in the world where civilizations have ceased because of soil erosion in the book Dirt. <clears throat> The photo on the cover of the book Dirt was taken north of Pierce, South Dakota, west of Oneida. Right in the heart of that area, you guys all say, oh, wow, those guys are great no tillers. But if they didn't, that's what it looks like. That's why David Montgomery came to visit me. I said, you should come and see that land again. Came to visit me a few years ago, and then he wrote this book, growing a revolution, and there's a whole section in there on that area of South Dakota and how it's changed. 1743, French fur traders were already in this part of the world. And the La Viandre brothers came across the continental divide in North Dakota, or in Manitoba, I think, and then crossed into North Dakota and came down the river. And they buried lead plates claiming this area for France. One of those was buried up the top of a hill, Fort Pierce, South Dakota. That's why Jefferson had to buy this area from France, or why he did. 1804, Lewis and Clark came up the Missouri River in October of 1804, they came right through here, right below us. What was on the river here in 1804? The Native Americans were farming on the islands in the river. They were growing corn. They were growing squash. Yes, Chris, we do grow a tropical grass in North Dakota. And we did that centuries before the white men got here. They were diverse, no-till farmers. They did not have any beasts of birding. The Aztec Empire, the Inca Empire, were all built in no-till. When our oldest daughter, who will turn 28 this week, next week, was a baby, Ruth and I went to Mexico and, and looked at Tehoticum. 
And I came back to, to Benjamin, and I said, they were very efficient farmers to build those pyramids. And he said, and they were all no-till. Because they didn't have beasts of burden until the Spaniards showed up. The farmers on the great, the, the Indians on the Great Plains were farmers until they had horses. You couldn't be a hunter-gatherer if you didn't have a horse. You'd starve to death out here. The hunter-gatherers were in the woods. The Sioux Indians really didn't move out west until they had horses. Okay, so we were farmers here. The people who were here before Lewis and Clark and the people that followed Lewis and Clark were looking for beavers. And they killed all these beavers and all the little beaver dams that were everywhere went away. How many people went to the movie The Revenant? Do you know where that took place? It's a true story. Yeah, Lemon, South Dakota, for Christ's sake. It's just prairie, like here. And they put it in all these trees. I mean, we're sitting there in the movie going, no, there's no trees in Lemon, South Dakota. It's all prairie. But we took all the beaver dams out. And Lon Tonneson had a slide up there. My wife has good eyes. And they're talking about they wanted to put in this surface water. Beaver dams. They said, we should have more beaver dams. 1909, they wanted more beaver dams. They took the damn beavers out. And they're also talking put it in big reservoirs because when we take out all the beaver dams, all the trees went away that were in the draws, and we started to get flooding. And when you get flooding, and you're flooding the big cities downriver, the government comes to help you. And instead of putting the damn beavers back, they said, let's build big dams. And then we can have groundbreaking and all this kind of stuff. So we're going to put four dams in South Dakota and one in North Dakota. Lucky you. You got one. We got four. <laughs> and they got one in Montana. And you can see Oahe Dam here, right there. It's a great big dam. We flooded a whole bunch of people out in a lot of lowlands. Our best livestock wintering areas are places we grew all the vegetables and stuff because it had better microclimate. We flooded that. Coal Lakes is right here, by the way. This is what they call the big meander in Lewis and Clark's journals. Big meander, we call it the pocket. Right in here is the pocket. Here's the big meander. We're just above the pocket, right up in there. Okay. And they said, in return, we'll give you 500,000 acres of irrigation because you can't possibly grow anything in South Dakota without irrigation, right? It's just too damn dry out there. Same way as North Dakota, we're going to put a bunch in North Dakota and South Dakota and you're all going to be happy, okay? Now, where are we going to irrigate South Dakota? Well, we have to go to the Lacustrian Lake Dakota Plain over here in the Jim River Valley, which is an old glacial lake. It's like the, it's like the Red River Valley up here, because you can irrigate the rolling lands in between. That's why they took the water to Jamestown, or we're going to, in North Dakota, because it gravity irrigation. You got to run it down the roads. Okay. There's a pump station right there that was supposed to do that. Pumps are in it, still there. <laughs> well, what happened? Okay. A couple of things happened. Some idiot came along and said, yeah, I think we can, you, can, you can grow things without irrigation. The other thing that happens with big reservoirs is they get full because they silt in. Our pump station at Redfield, at, 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 at Pier, had eight foot of freeboard in 1990. When we put it in, I could just stand on the bottom and reach up and hit the bottom of the screen with my hand. Right now, for the last five years, it's under four foot of silt. So we no longer use it. Those reservoirs will silt in. So will the Three Gorges Reservoir in China. That's what dams do. Beavers build dams, they silt in, they go build a new dam. We need to put the beaver back. 
Nobody likes beavers. So a bunch of, <laughs> some idiot made a center pivot. Now we can irrigate this ground along the Missouri River, and a bunch of guys decided in the big hoo-ha after the Russian wheat deal that we're going to irrigate. And we're going to use these high-pressure irrigators, and we'll spread the water on, we'll put an inch of water on in about 40 minutes. And we'll be happy, okay? Well, no, the water all ran off. <laughs> Because somebody told them to grow corn and irrigated corn, you have to plow. Got to have it nice and black and whatever, and all ran off and ran back into the river. Not a good thing. If you look at that pivot, you've got a dry spot, a kind of okay pot, and then this is too wet, and then it runs off, okay? And as a response to that, a bunch of irrigators got together, and they said, geez, we need some answers because we're running all our water back into the river. And, and in a bar one night with a, <clears throat> a bunch of farmers, we decided we should have our own farm that we owned and, and then let the university do some research there. So that's how Dakota Lake started. It's owned, directed by farmers, all fixed facilities owned by the farmers. Got a board of directors, and, and I work with that board of directors, and I'm also a college professor type. Uh, profits from the production enterprise help support the research. We have both irrigating dry land. Uh, we've been 100% load disturbance no-till since 1990, and we got a lot of crop rotations. Big thing is the mission statement. The mission statement says nothing about no-till. Go Lakes Research Farm to has as its primary mission the conducting of projects designed to research, identify, and demonstrate to its members and the community at large the best methods of stabilizing the agriculture economy through promoting agricultural diversity, increasing production efficiency, minimizing negative environmental effects, maintaining soil productivity, and developing techniques to mitigate biological stress effects. Nothing in there about no-till. That was 1983 or four, we decided to do that. That's where the mission statement came in. Said nothing about no-till. All my board members were irrigators, and every one of them did conventional till. But when we went to build the facility, I said, if I no-till it, I can do different things with the size of the pipes and the size of the pump. I save money there. I don't have to buy as much equipment. Whatever. It would be our economic advantage just to make it a no-till farm to start with. And they discussed it, and all of a sudden, Ralph Holdsworth, who some of you guys know, was the president, he says, I know how to farm with tillage. I don't know how to farm with no tillage. Let's no till the damn thing. Everybody goes, okay. <laughs> okay, so we went from Redfield, where they were going to take that water, out to here. And they didn't think they could do anything here other than grow uh, spring wheat and barley. Here they thought they had to irrigate everything. So let's look at the characteristics. The dry land spring wheat and barley in the east, dry land spring wheat, winter wheat, summer fallow in the west, irrigated corn production in both areas. All the corn production was, all that, all that production was done full whip tillage with multiple passes. By 2014, that's those same areas, dry land corn, soybeans, and wheat in the east, dry land spring wheat, winter wheat, corn, oil seeds, and pulse crops in the west, almost no fallow, and the irrigated acreage. The guys that put us in business has predominantly been converted to dry land because of cost. The guys with lifts over 150 feet have all converted back to dry land. Dan Forge from Cronin Farms, and Dan and Monty, uh, Monty Cronin, Dan Forge, I was talking to them the other day. Francis went, rode on a real combine. <clears throat> combine of 260 bushel irrigated corn. But they had a field of dry land corn went 198 bushels at Gettysburg, South Dakota. Because they're efficiently using the water, okay? Now, if we compare what those farmers in those areas that have changed over are doing compared to what they did in 2000 and 
14, uh, 2014 compared to 1986. These uh, rainfall years about the same. They made $1.6 billion more in 2014 than they did in 1986. If you drive from here to pier, you see lots of brand new grain bins. You see lots of brand new houses. You see an ethanol plant going up in Oneida. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? We now have at Gettysburg two kindergarten classes, two first and second grade classes where they'd gone to almost closing the school 15 years ago. The success we had was not achieved because we set out to improve yields. The goal was to better manage an ecosystem processes with natural systems as our model. Uh, they call that transformational change uh, or transitional. I call it a systems approach, holistic approach. I stole this from Jay Fuhrer. The light bulb did not result by incrementally making candles better. Most of our ag research now is looking to incrementally make, you get two bushel more. See? Duh. How are we managing things? Now, you heard all kinds of stuff the last two days. I said to Francis last night, it's a little bit like drinking from a fire hose. He had no concept of what that meant, so we had to explain it. <laughs> right? So it's just kind of an American thing. Short-term studies are not accurate in evaluating treatments such as tillage or rotations. Most research right now, and John Lundgren talked about this, we used to get the money come from the federal government, came to the states, the states decided what to do with it. That ran our ag experiment station. Sometime in the Ronald Reagan administration, they decided they wanted to do it all with grants. I have no idea why, but that's what it's converted to now. And all this stuff is done with these little short-term grants that are two and three year grants. If we didn't have Dakota Lakes there, we wouldn't have any of these long-term studies. They just don't happen. So we're gonna use ecosystem processes. If you felt a little confused, <laughs> the last two days about, I can't do that. What the hell? I don't know what to, gee, how do you do that? Why is he doing that? Just look at the ecosystem processes and what you're doing and say, how am I doing in terms of these ecosystem processes? And if you think about what these people are doing, they're doing something to help them do a better job of the ecosystem processes. Just these four things, how are you doing there? Okay, the water cycle. The energy flow, the mineral cycle, community dynamics, those four things. How are you doing in terms of matching what the native vegetation would do? Does the rain feed plants and recharge the soil and groundwater, or does it run off or deep percolate or cause erosion and water quality degra degradation? If you've got saline seeps and these kind of things, your water cycle is broken. You're not matching the water cycle. You can't take in the Red River Valley, you can't take a tall grass prairie and put in corn and soybeans. It's not even close. My tall grass prairie plants that we have will put a root system down seven or eight or nine feet to extract water. And they're growing all year. I went to Argentina a year ago now. They're doing the same thing. They're taking out trees, they're taking out tall grass prairie, putting in soybean on soybean on soybean, and the water table rises, and they're getting rivers forming and lakes forming where they were never there before. It's the stupidest thing in the world. You're just, it's just like, well, we got to do that to make money. No, you got to do something to try to stop screwing up the ecosystem. Back to this water thing with the irrigators. We went out there to try to fix the water cycle. We can now put on uh, two inches of water in nine minutes. Yeah, Derek wasn't kidding. And we also walk them right in behind that irrigator. And you don't get your feet muddy. And you don't sink in. We had some people from Minnesota there last year. We walked in behind the irrigator after we put on two inches of water in nine minutes. 
And this lady goes, oh, this is crazy. I went, no, ma'am, this isn't crazy. This is the way water is supposed to go in the ground. What you do in Minnesota is crazy, where when you walk in there and you had a little rain, you sink up to your ankles. That's crazy. And whatever. No runoff with irrigators applying two inches of water in nine minutes. Yes, we have irrigators sometimes something stupid happens, like the guy puts a cord out there in the wrong spot and it gets caught under the water hose and the machine stops instead of tearing the cord in half. And it'll water for five or six hours in the same spot before we get out there in the morning and go, uh-oh. And we still have no runoff. And we still, you know, it just goes down. In those Mac reports, when it fills up, it just goes on down. Or if it does run off, uh, it's clean. It's because we have the armor, because we have the macro pores. <clears throat> Here's a wheel track with an irrigator. This is about an 18-year wheel track. That's as deep as it gets. If you do tillage and you go out too early in the spring, how deep do you sink? As deep as you did tillage. Right? Because that's where the discontinuity in the macro pores are. And the water goes in that far, and then that has to fill up and saturate there before it goes on. So the secret is, don't do tillage, and you won't sink. It's just, but this isn't hard. This, this is really not hard. Take the E out of ET. ET is evapotranspiration for the non-irrigators in the room. The water use, total water use on landscape is a combination of evaporation or transpiration. That evaporation makes you no money. Jimmy Emmons said earlier today, he said, well, you can see the water going in, but you can't see it coming out. Well, yeah, he's right. You don't see it going up, right? That's the evaporation part. Keep the damn residue on there. You don't see it going up because it doesn't go up. It stays down. Make water enter the soil, and the big one is maximize the water holding capacity of the soil. We've taken the organic matter to half. We've reduced the water holding capacity of our soils. So these gorgeous soils in the <clears throat> Red River Valley, they used to be six, seven, eight percent organic matter, are now low organic matter. They hold less water, so we, we don't grow crops that suck out the deep water. So instead of having it empty to eight feet, we got it maybe empty to two or three. So now we get three feet. Maybe they hold an inch and a half to three feet. So three times an inch and a half is four and a half inches. Doesn't take very much water to waterlog them. If they held more water, if they hold two and a half inches, now you can take three more inches of water. Right? So the first thing is try to build the organic matter up and then suck out the stuff down below. Well, it's a good idea for irrigators. It's a great idea for guys without irrigation. Like I said, most of our guys have quit irrigating. My PhD orals, one of the guys on my committee, <clears throat> had spent his life working on the Wahi project, which is our version of the Garrison project. And he said, Dwayne, now that you've been at the Redfield for a year, or one summer, because I had to wait till that fall for my professor, major professor, to come home from Botswana. He said, now that, before I took my oils, he said, now that you've been there for the summer, what do you think? I said, I don't think we need the Oahe Project. I think if we, if we no-till, we can grow corn and soybeans in River Valley just fine, without irrigation. Not my best response to a question. But anyway, at that time, 1983, there was 1,900 acres of soybeans in Spink and Brown County combined. So they're now the number one and number two corn and soybean producing counties in the state, and they're, none of them are irrigated. Okay? Ecosystems harvest sunlight, and that drives all other processes. Removing the products from the ecosystem reduces the energy available. If I hear one more person talk about biomass ethanol, I'm going to puke. What a stupid idea that is. <clears throat> we take half of the grain, half of the energy when it comes out with the grain. 
And then we're going to take the rest of it. Is the energy you use, is it constant or finite? Is it benign or potentially damaging? Is it internal or external? The energy you use in your farming operation. <clears throat> energy is a constant or finite. The sun's going to come up tomorrow. And if you control some land, that sun is yours. If it doesn't come up tomorrow, well, let's get out whoever had the bourbon. Let's get that stuff out. <laughs> we just as well enjoy it because we're not going to last very damn long, right? We're out of here. <clears throat> so it's constant. And we do a crappy job of harvesting it. Fossil fuels, on the other hand, are finite. We're going to run out of them. I'm not sure why we're in such a hurry to get rid of our fossil fuels. You know, we could do this a little more slowly and leave some for the kids. We have none in South Dakota. That makes hell to any difference to us. We're just watching you guys in North Dakota. I mean, why are you in such a big hurry? Is it benign or potentially damaging? Sunlight is benign, other than for us fair-skinned Europeans that have no business being here, we get skin cancer, right? <clears throat> but fossil fuels are potentially damaging, both when you extract them and the, those unintended consequences, internal or external. Again, sunlight is internal, your land. External, you have to buy it. Money, will the money you use build infrastructure? Is it a once-only expense? <clears throat> or do you have to keep doing it? If you buy a tractor, you have to keep putting fuel in it. And to a large extent, things like fungicides and herbicides and whatever, if you get to use them on a regular basis, they're addictive. Are the nutrients available for plant use or environmental services, or have they been leached, eroded, or transported from the landscape. Ecosystems that leak nutrients turn into deserts. That's what's happened in France. A 120-car train of soybeans contains 400,000 pounds of phosphate. Every governor loves to stand by these track loaders, these big circle track loaders, and have, have our groundbreaking, and isn't this great? Bullshit. Why are we sending our phosphorus away? That ethanol plant that they put at Oneida, they wanted me to come and talk about what impacts that would have. And I said, if you export the ethanol, all you've sent away is the carbon dioxide and the water. Mother Nature will bring those back. If you take the distiller's grain and ship it out instead of feeding it to the livestock locally, now you've exported the nutrients. The same is true of soybeans. Ship out the oil, it's carbon dioxide and water. Start shipping out the meal or the whole soybeans, you ship out the nutrients. Saline seeps. When the kids from the Votech College or the university come to visit, I ask them what's in a saline seep. If they say salt, their instructor gets yelled at. It's not salt. Darren Hefty told me that one day, and I gave him about a 20-minute master's oral quiz in front of the Corn Council. And one of the Corn Council guys told me afterwards, he said, I really felt sorry for him. <clears throat> I said, he's selling millions of dollars worth of stuff, and he didn't know these rudimentary things about soil fertility. So why did you feel sorry for him? Right? What's in a saline seep is fertilizer. Number one thing is usually nitrates, and then there's lip gypsum and lime. That's what's in a saline seep. It's fertilizer. So if they say fertilizer, their teacher gets an attaboy. So we're going to try to stop the leakage by using cover crops as one of our tools. It's not the only tool. And you can be very successful at managing an ecosystem without using cover crops. But cover crops let you fine-tune at times. Okay, so here's cover crops on one side, not on the other side. You see a milk jug there, tells you how tall everything is. That's a stripper head, so we're, we're catching things. So there's our cover crops. We try to get some diversity, right? Do lots of different things. We can 
put, if you put in corn by itself versus corn and soybeans together, you don't get the nitrogen thing. We've done all these kind of things. There's some neat tricks. There's alfalfa in corn. There's the alfalfa after we've harvested and grazed the corn, and that's in the spring before we plant corn again. Uh, there's that stuff we flew in. Catch and release nutrients. Yeah, I got that from Jeremy Wilson. But I did walk up and tell him when I stole it, I said, I'm going to take that thing and I'm going to use it, Jeremy. And it, you can tell everybody that I stole it, but I'm going to steal it anyway. <clears throat> it's kind of like Jay Fuhrer and this thing there. So fertility management. I believe that if we're going to sell products off the farm, we have to replace the nutrients we sell to a large extent. I also think we can run our phosphorus levels much, much lower than what we are now. Phosphorus levels on the soil test P is really solubility, not how much. And if you don't have a healthy root system, go down to the bottom. The key factors are available nutrient, interacting with moisture and roots. So if we have mycorrhizae there, if we have mycorrhizae there, we have these massive root systems. So we can run P lower, and we have studies going on showing that. Community dynamics, do miss, many species have fairly stable populations, right? Well, how are your species are doing? Weeds and diseases are nature's way of adding diversity to a system that lacks diversity. If, 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 if you have a problem with a weed or diseases, you provide the opportunity and then does the action you do address the weakest point in the life cycle of the organism? When do we spray herbicides? Once the plant's up. That's not the weakest spot. Keep the weeds from going to seed. Keep the weed seeds from getting in there. We've had resistant weeds forever. This photo was taken in the 1980s. No, early 1990s, when, when cyanamid said pursuit there wasn't going to be resistance to pursuit. So we proved them wrong. That's kosher weed, by the way. That's chickpeas hiding behind the kosher weeds. Nature's way uh, efforts to add diversity can be countered by adding beneficial diversity to the system. <clears throat> Gabe was talking about planting all this stuff together. So was Derek. Well, they have less weeds because they put all these other things in there. Right? We're going to put all these plants in there. We're going to have less weeds because we, they don't have that niche. We've had no need to apply broadcast insecticides at Dakota Lakes for over 16 years because we have the predators. Number one reason for aphid mortality is fungal disease. Predators are number two, but most thing, the thing that gets aphids the worst is fungi. So we have the dealers telling you, come out and spray a little herbicide, and we'll put our fungicide and our <clears throat> insecticide in with it, because it's only a buck. You've killed the predators, you killed the fungi. OK? Uh, this is one of my favorite photos. That's a burrowing owl, if you've never seen one. Sitting on top of my irrigation disconnect, one of my irrigation disconnect, and they built their nest underneath the pad. And they raised four little guys this summer. And people say, well, they only live in native grasslands. I'm <laughs> going, well, OK. But they lived underneath our irrigation thing, and they seemed quite happy there. So they didn't like my hunting dog very much, but he was stupid enough he didn't know what they were. He didn't run right by them. Um, No-till is not about lack of tillage, but about managing soil water, soil structure, and carbon compounds in the soil. Tillage is to agriculture with fracking is to petroleum. We both, both increase the speed and extent of removal of compounds from the ecosystem. Tillage allowed us to mine the soil better. And we can get higher yield, but we're mining the soil, and eventually it's worn out, just like fracking. Citizens of the U.S. and Canada, I added that today, you need to decide what you would like agriculture to look like in the future. And then tell your damn politicians what you want them to do or tell them to get the hell out of the road. I am very frustrated with what's happening in politics. I mean, nobody's looking ahead. We should be looking ahead 600 years. If you can't think that far ahead, think 200 years. 
What politicians are thinking about is the next damn election. Why are we spending $10 million to elect a senator in a state like North Dakota? You don't have that many people. Who's making the money? Why are they that interested? Native American culture-based decision on their potential impact for the next seven generations, or 280 years. Never in history of all mankind knowingly faced this type of impending catastrophe of the change in the potential change in the ecosystem. And we all know, but we don't want to admit that we need to do something. We need to do something. Research needs to be transformational and, and transitional and not incremental. 80% of the total input costs in agriculture can be traced directly to energy at the present time. 1970, the wheat price was $1.37 a bushel. The price of barrel oil is $3.39. Think about what that ratio is today, and we're using 80% of the cost is fossil fuel. In Minnesota, where tillage is king, it takes slightly under 10 gallons of diesel fuel per acre for tillage seeding and harvest. It takes one gallon of, of uh, the energy of one gallon of diesel fuel to manufacture five pounds of N, or 150 pounds of N is 30 gallons of diesel fuel. Think about that one, okay? Fossil fuel input in agriculture 120 years ago was zero. Uh, 120 years from now, it'll have to be zero again. And we haven't even started to look at that. We're all worried about these little incremental things. We're going to be fossil fuel neutral by 2026 because we press our oil seats. And that means we can sell our oil and that replaces the stuff we have to buy. Uh, look at systems, not details, outputs, not inputs. Action, not reaction. Right now we're reacting to, oh, this disease or that disease or whatever. Let's just act. Commitment, not involvement. Yesterday at the hotel they had scrambled eggs with ham, so they had both involved. The chicken was involved and the pig was committed. <laughs> Science and reason. Science is okay. We need to start listening to science, not emotion and rumors, and address the problem instead of treating the symptom, and this one's in here for Jay. Terraces treat the symptom. When Jay first visited me, I spent the day making fun of terraces and waterways. I didn't know that he was into those at the time, so. <laughs> I have learned more from observing nature than trying to change it. Mother Nature's been managing ecosystems for longer than anyone else. She harvests max amounts of sunlight. She leaks very few nutri nutrients, including carbon dioxide, from the system. Uh, she makes maximum use of water and nutrients by having webs of VAM and other tricks, and she uses animals, big ones and small ones, in the system. So here's our swath grazing stuff. And that's what it looks like. We Notice we still have the armor after they've grazed it. This is a, a spring shot of where we grazed in the fall. And that stripped wheat stubble is still laying down there. It hasn't been disturbed. Get good grades feed stuff. There's a picture of the cows. Cows on tall grass prairie. More cows. Uh, these are ours. Uh, <clears throat> here's a little trick. We've got our, our trailers. You can use a regular semi-trailer. We use our tur trailers. It makes a nice calf shelter. And then you fold it up and you move it to the next, next place. So when you guys aren't turning on it, we're using it for calf shelter. It's just kind of one of those things. Um, <clears throat> so, the world's supply of mineable phosphorus will be exhausted in less than 120 years. Use of perennial sequences or perennial cover crops will be necessary, and I haven't seen anybody really bring that up seriously in the new farm bill. Okay? She does not do tillage, and she does not export nutrients. All tillage tools destroy soil structure. All tillage tools decre uh, decrease water infiltration. All tillage tools reduce organic matter and all tillage tools increase weeds. And you have all these people running around saying, oh, I got this new tillage tool, do this. They all do this. So you just say, here, I, I know these all do this, I'm not interested. 
She does not care which species survive or die. We do these things for our descendants, uh, not for the planet. It makes no sense for North America, South America, or Europe to degrade their ecosystem to attempt to export and feed people in other countries. They can't afford it, and people like Francis can make it all by themselves. We just have to help them be able to do that. We can't have this happen. Ruminant animals provide the best solution for creating human edible protein on marginal land. Anybody that says we're all going to go vegan or vegetarian? And one of my technicians keeps telling me that. Oh, we're just all going to be vegetarian anyway. Oh, yeah, stupid shit. Um, <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> what we need is more cows, more goats, and more sheep. There's more goats eaten in the world, more pounds of goat than there is beef. So for you guys that like goats, that's a good thing. Bureaucracies, governments, and corporations are operated with people with limited or short tenure, short-term goals. Society, landowners, farmers. We have to drive the long-term goals. Climate will change in 600 years, but we'll still be a continental climate. We're going to be cold in the winter. We're going to be hot and dry in the summer. Degradation of the ecosystem will, be, will have more potential impact. The change in the ecosystem from when Lewis and Clark came up this river 200 years ago till now is much greater than what the change and climate has done to it. We've had more impact by far, more negative impact than the climate change. I've learned more from farmers than they've learned from me. They harvest sunlight, carbon dioxide, water to produce things we can sell. Some of this is human food, so we need to be aware of that. If you want to eat beef, we should concentrate producing beef instead of corn or barley that feeds beef and feedlots. If we don't get our act together, we're going to end. This was done in Afghanistan, by the way. And what's wrong there is he doesn't have the armor. It's all been carried away. Okay? Peak oil is when half the oil is gone. Peak phosphorus is when half the phosphorus is gone. Peak soil is when half the soil is gone. We're past that point. All three of those. Take the E out of ET. Take the T out of can't. Doing the right thing environmentally is almost always the correct economic approach in the long run. Look forward, not backwards. Thank you.